Hi everyone, welcome to this newest video. Uh, my name is Johan and together with me is a very special guest, is one of my personal friends, Mr. Frank Deneman. Uh, Frank is a chief technologist at uh, VMware and Frank, you're gonna talk to us today about a, a topic that's really close to you, right? Yeah, I'm going to talk about NUMA. NUMA stands for Non-Uniform Memory Architecture and that is present in today's service. Um, I've written a few books about it. Uh, it's always a hot topic uh, at uh, VMworld and VMUX, so I thought let's uh, let's do a light board session together with you, and uh, hopefully uh, some uh, viewers will uh, will learn something from it. Awesome. Well, I'm I'm really enthusiastic about the topic. Uh, of course, well I, I have all the books as well. Ah, nice. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Let's let's dig into it. Okay. Uh, so let's begin with the architecture itself. So when we talk about CPUs, there are many different things. We have what's called a CPU package. That's typically the way we describe it, it's, it's the thing that you can hold in your hand. When you order a CPU and you get a CPU package. Now in, inside that CPU package, you have something called CPU cores. That's the stuff where the calculation uh, appears. There's some local cache and there is a memory controller. Right, and that memory controller connects to the memory modules, what we like to call DIMMs, right? So if you want to, 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 to write it out, let's say you have a four core um, CPU, right? Physical cores, we're not talking hyperthreading, right? No, we're not talking okay. hyperthreading yet. So we have four cores and we have what's called a memory controller, which is located in the CPU package itself. Right. So these four cores, they they talk to the memory controller to access the DIMMs, right? Now these DIMMs are connected through channels to the memory controller, and typically you have four. Now the latest Intel CPU has six memory controllers, and I will talk, to, uh, talk about that a little bit later, right? Now, if you have a, a, a workload and you run it, and you run vSphere, of course, and that virtual machine has one vCPU, you will occupy a core whenever you want to schedule workload, right? right? Let's say it's on this one. The moment it, acts, it needs memory, what the kernel tries to do is it tries to allocate memory resources connected to that memory controller. That's here, basically. Now, from that point, we talk about uh, local access. Right. Right? But... The majority of servers, they have two CPU packages, so two socket servers, yeah. which you typically uh, 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 talk about. Now, those uh, uh, two C uh, sockets, they are what's considered two NUMA domains, because what we have is we have an interconnect, and I'll talk a little bit later about that, and there you have your four sockets again, and this is the memory control. This is apparently a fatter memory control than that one, but, <laughs> <laughs> right? Hey, it's a whiteboard. Uh, yeah, so, and we have the DIMMs again. Now, this memory, this vCPU can access uh, memory over here, but through the interconnect, it can also uh, access memory over here. Now, we're still talking about the same physical server, right? But although the memory uh, allocation is not via the local memory controller, but via the remote memory controller, we talk about remote access, right? Still on the same server. So right. we're not accessing memory on another server no, or whatever, right. right? So this is the, 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 the stuff. So this is what we call a NUMA domain. Uh, NUMA and this is NUMA. Now the funny thing is, it's called uh, non-uniform, right? And the reason why it's a non-uniform memory access, although it's on the same server, is that we need to go through that interconnect. Right. Now, like I said, we have four memory channels here, and each of these memory channel has some bandwidth. Typically what you do when you write memory is you um, interleave across all the channels. That means that you write something on one channel and on, on a second one and a third one and a fourth one. The reason why you do that is so you get the most bandwidth. So you allocate all the bandwidth that is vis uh, physical right. available. Now, this, those four memory channels, they have a bigger bandwidth than your interconnect. Right, so right? you would like to 
uh, keep your your um, your resources as local as possible. Correct. Now, that's the ultimate goal, and it's the ultimate goal for consistent performance, right? Typically, when you talk to customers, customers don't rave about peak performance. They like to have consistent performance. They won't call you up and say, look, today was a perfect day and you got the best performance ever. But they will, they will call you up when they say, look, it's really weird. It's, sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow. If you give a perfect, consistent performance, that's where people get used to, unless it's really slow, of course. But that's the, the, the baseline of performance you, typically, right? You basically uh, can, can predict your, 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 uh, your future. It, it, it supports predictability, so exactly. that's good. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, so that's the reason why you want to keep it inside a NUMA node. Because right. we talked about bandwidth, but we also have distance, right? Yeah. And with everything with, with physics, uh, distance means more time. So what Latency happens... Latency based good. Exactly. Yeah. So what you typically see is local memory access is around 75 nanoseconds, whereas remote access, still on the same server, we talk about 120 nanoseconds, almost wow. twice as much, wow. right? Um, so that's something uh, that is not what you want, no. right? The, pr the thing is, it's still faster than swapping, compressing, whatever you can do w with memory, right? So don't be afraid if you have it, but think about your designs, right? right? Now. The thing with, uh, with the inconsistency is that it's not always that case. Meaning, what I mean by that is, sometimes you have local memory and sometimes you have remote memory. But you're only, not the only one using that system. That right. VM is not the only one. So typically you have 10, 20, 40, 80 virtual machines. And they all need to find a place somewhere. They are not scheduled all, all of the time, every VM. Uh, right. But Sometimes this VM comes along, sometimes that VM comes along, and the kernel can move things around as well. And what you do when you move things around is you use that internet. internet right, so you, 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 you will get some cross-domain uh, traffic. Yes. You, you, will, you will get that. Typically, but the thing is you want to avoid it because even if you're not very uh, interested in keeping the consistent consistency of that particular workload, what you're doing with spanning is you're creating more traffic through that interconnect. So you're right. impacting other workloads as well. Right. So you did just talked about VMs. So yeah. when creating a VM, and, and I think most of us uh, have, have experienced that during the creation of the VM, you can choose um, to have, for instance, if you need four cores, you can spread them uh, uh, to, uh, or you can divide them by two sockets, so mm -hmm. have two sockets with two cores, or have a single socket with four cores. Yeah. Does that impact uh, the way NUMA works? Yeah, that's what we call cores per sockets, but right. let's move one level down below to, un to understand cores per socket. So right. let's say, and now I'm, I'm, I'm leaving this four, um, four core uh, package a little bit uh, alone because I want to have a better uh, example. So let's say a modern CPU has 10 cores, right? right? That's basically the sweet spot, the 10, 12 core is the sweet spot in today's lineup. So let's say you have those CPUs. Let's, let's see if I can do this right. One, two, three, four. Six. Six, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now let's say, uh, let's use this. So, so we have uh, 12, 12, cores. 12 cores, right? <laughs> yeah. Saved by the light board. Yeah. One more. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, I cannot count very yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so these are the cores, and then you have your, your, your memory attached to it as well, and here is your memory attached to it as well. Okay, so let's say uh, we have a virtual machine that has 16 vCPUs, right? No. Like a true monster VM. Almost, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. What we like to call it uh, is a wide VM. And a wide why, VM. Why do we call it a wide VM? Because it's going to span one NUMA node. Right. Right? Okay. So what the kernel does is it counts cores when right. creating a NUMA client. Right. right. So we have a NUMA domain. And now we need to make sure that that particular VM can be scheduled within the system itself. And you need a NUMA client in order to do that. Yes. Okay. Now the... the, 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 the the internal names are 
physical proximity domain and virtual proximity domain. So what happens is that, let's say you have 16 vCPUs. Now, what, it's, what the kernel is going to do is it's going to count. So it says 1 to 12. Now, yeah. 16 doesn't fit in 12, so it's going to split up in two. So it's going to create two physical proximity domains for scheduling purposes. That is the element, the construct for the CPU scheduler to take care of. Right. What it will do, it will equally distribute those vCPUs across those two right. proximity domains. So what we have here is we're going to create two proximity domains, VPDs. zero and one. And because we have 16 vCPUs, it's going to say divided by two. So that means I'm going to have eight vCPUs in this PPD, right? right. Now, this, uh, this physical proximity domain can be scheduled on this number node or can be scheduled on that number node. Right. Dependent on the traffic, um, on the utilization, and on the, the, the request of that particular domain itself. It also could be impacted by the, the number of VMs you have running, yes. the, 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 the ready times. Uh, yes. Right, okay. Yeah. So that's what it's going to do. But what we also introduce, because we are a wide VM, we span two NUMA clients, is what we're going to do is we're going to create a virtual proximity domain. Now within that virtual proximity domain, we're going to say, what, what, what did we say? Eight, right? One, Eight yeah. two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> one fat core. One fat core. That, that, that's the one who, uh, who does the work, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, four, five, six, this is really bad. One more. Yeah. 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 Okay. So this is the VPD, right? And this is what we're going to show to the uh, guest OS and right. the application. So this ah, is what you right. what we call, what most people call VNUMA, ah, right? right? So okay. with VNUMA, we don't, we don't share this, we share this. So the VM itself, in this case, only knows that there are two NUMA domains, basically, yeah. with eight uh, cores per domain. Per domain, yeah. right? Okay. And and by default, we use a one course per socket configuration. Right. Now think about this: if you want, if you would draw the the motherboard, you will have sixteen sockets, virtual sockets, with each one core. That's right. not not such a thing in the world, right? No. But that's that's the beauty, and that's one of the magical things of of the virtual machine or VMware, right? But you can change. The, uh, the, the course per socket, right? Now, the, the, the thing is what I wanna uh, 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 show is that this makes sure that the VPD, the kernel makes sure that the VPD is scheduled by, the, the, by using the VPD and they're trying to keep the memory as local as possible, right? But we still can have remote memory, whatever, right? And these two can change as well. This. VPD can be scheduled on this NUMA node. But it, the, um, it will try to, to keep the, the entire VPD on a single NUMA node. Yes. Right, yeah. yeah. There's, not, there's, there's little chance, really little chance, that you will see both VPDs on the same, um, on the same physical NUMA uh, node itself. Right. That can, be, uh, that, that can happen, but that's in an, in an extreme rare situation. Okay. When you do, when you follow the defaults. Right. But now you talked about uh, 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 about cores per, per socket. That's where it's going to change. But now what you do with C, uh, with CPS cores per socket is you're going to say I'm smarter uh, than the kernel, or maybe I need to do this because of licensing problems or whatever. Oh, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's say, and this is what you typically see with a lot of uh, customers, they're going to say, I'm going to use two cores per socket. That's part of my standard, and I always want to adhere to my standard. But right. what, you'll, what you'll do is you're going to say, give me different numbers or multiple numbers of VPDs. So we're going to say that, hey, I've got two cores per socket. 
Now that socket becomes a virtual uh, proximity domain. Right. So we have eight. That means that now we have four different elements to show to the um, to the uh, guest OS. Right. What we do in 6.5 is we don't impact the design of the PPD. So we still say, look, I know what you're doing here, but this is not the way the physical uh, uh, layout is represented. So I'm going to keep my PPD as close to the physical uh, uh, layout as possible. And what we do, what we expose to the SOS is based on the wishes of the customer, right? right? So we try to uh, try to, to adhere to both worlds. Oh, right, okay. Try to do the best uh, on the compute side, but also try to, to do whatever the customer asks us to do. Right, so, so now we have uh, also four uh, uh, NUMA nodes here. This is what we're going to expose to the, to the, um, to uh, the guest OS. Can, yeah. can you imagine what, ha what happens in this situation? Um, well, I'm, I'm guessing because we have like two um, sockets per virtual domain that it'll try to keep it as, as local as possible. Yeah, that, that's what we want to do because we have the PPD. Yeah. But what the, the, what the guest OS sees, it, it sees tiny little NUMA domains. Oh, right. So what, the reason why we expose NUMA to the guest OS is to... Uh, to make to, to, to benefit from the NUMA optimizations in the guest OS and in the application. Oh, but now right. what it needs to do is it says, look, I got these two cores and a tiny little bit of memory, and that apparently is remote from that one. And that one is remote of that one. Oh, and, right. right. So you get a lot of inter-domain uh, traffic. Uh, well, yeah. Well, virtually. virtually so yeah, yeah, yeah. if this VM cannot access memory over here, it needs uh, access memory over there. Now, the, the optimization, uh, and depending on the optimization of the guest OS, it is going to try to avoid it, or it's basically giving up. This is unnecessary because the physical domain looks completely different, yeah. right? So one of our recommendations is, if you want to do this, understand the physical location. Look at your, cluster, uh, your, your server configuration, and figure out a way how many cores per, per socket you have, real physical ones. Right. And now what you will say is, look, I've got 12, uh, but they can fit, uh, 8 can fit in 1 because I have 16, right? So because I'm dividing by 2. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a CPS of 8 to 1. 8 cores per socket. If you do that, then you mimic the physical layout the uh, guest OS sees a NUMA domain of like a, a single course. one. Yes. Right. And now it can optimize again. It makes sense. Right. Right. So um, in the the um, like the the hardware world, yeah. well, we we have seen um, the same CPU architecture mainly for for a, a, a pretty long time, but yeah. there are some different architectures that came out in the last couple of years. Yeah. So how does this reflect to other CPU architectures? That's a good question. So it's really funny if you, if you look at, at today's world. We have, in the enterprise world, 95% use a, a dual socket system, yeah. right? There are some remnants of a system with four sockets. Like back in 2000, I used, uh, used to operate a, a, an insane cluster with 585s with four uh, um, AMD uh, um, CPUs, and gradually when the core count went up, we, we reduced to two sockets due to the uh, licensing cost, of course, the, yeah. uh, the software licensing cost. But what you see is that in this spectrum, we have two outliers. We have what's called the Intel XeonD, and we have AMD EPIC. Now with Intel XeonD, um, there's a, an interesting uh, story on the next web uh, and it goes into detail about how Facebook looked at this problem, what's called the NUMA problem. Uh, and they, they looked at their workload and for their web environment, they said, I just need a few CPU cores with insane amount of memory. So, but I don't want to have the inconsistency, right? So they started talking to Intel 
uh, Intel gathered some information and together with some other uh, companies, they, uh, they formed the Intel Xeon D. So an Intel Xeon D, you cannot buy it as a dual socket system. No. Why? Because that whole idea of getting rid of the NUMA uh, 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 problem is, is the, the reason why it was invented. Right. right. Now, the other end of the spectrum, that's where we have what's called cluster on die, what you can do on an Intel system, and um, uh, AMD with Epic. So what AMD has and cluster on die is on the same physical uh, package, you have multiple NUMA domains. Now that's an interesting, interesting design. So I need to make some room for 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 to to explain the 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 um, the AMD uh, uh, structure a little bit more. Let's see if this works. Before I break the glass, it's diamond glass. You won't break it. Oh, trust me. <laughs> You'll probably break your arm first. <laughs> Let's. I think I have enough room if I clear this one out. Do I need to clean the whole whiteboard? Or is this good enough? Depends on the rest of your drawing. No, this should be enough. Now let's 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 keep it clean. So with AMD, they released the AMD Epic, and I think it's a really interesting architecture. And I think uh, for for every for every technical problem, there's a technical solution. And so yeah. for AMD, there's they they are they they have this this new architecture which can be uh, which can benefit for uh, to uh, to workloads with a small footprint. Right. Right. Uh, let's use the blue one. Okay. So if we uh, what I draw was basically an Intel architecture. Yeah. We have some uh, we have some uh, some cores and we have an internal memory uh, configuration uh, memory controller and and then we have an interconnect. Now, uh, AMD follows the same idea, but what they do is they split it up. So we're talking about one CPU package right now. So one AMD Epic that you can hold in your hand. And in that CPU package, they have what's called a Zeppelin die. Now that Zeppelin, that, uh, let's call it Zeppelin. That Zeppelin, that is, what used to be what we saw as a ZPU, right? So that Zeppelin die, that has the cores, the, uh, the local cache, and the memory controller, right? Right. Now, within that Zeppelin, and now there are four Zeppelins within... Right, because up till so far, it's, it's the same like the Intel architecture. Yeah. Right, yeah. but now but they have four dies. Right, so where on a single... Package. package. Yeah, that's right. the reason why I call it a package and not a die in the first right. place, because in Intel, the package is the same as a die. Right. But in uh, AMD, you have a package with four dies. And every die supplements. has multiple cores, a memory controller, uh, and cache. Exactly. And right. what they did is they have what's called a CCX. Uh, that stands for Compute Complex. And within that Compute Complex, you have four cores, right? So a Zeppelin die has eight cores, the, the largest one, of course, right? right? The 32-core AMD Epic. And within a Zeppelin, you have a memory controller, right? So they, and this is interesting, they have two channels. That memory controller has two channels. So this Zeppelin die has two DIMMs, this one, One. Right? Does that mean that every CCX has its own um, memory controller? Yes. So they have their own memory controller, MC, MC, and now this becomes the interesting one because they have their own memory controller and their own cores, a Zeppelin die becomes a NUMA node. So this is a NUMA node. This is a new one node. This is a new one node. And we're still talking about a single AMD processor, right, which you can, what can fit inside your a hand. A single package. Yeah. So now, 
if you use two a uh, a b epics in one server you have eight numa wow uh, nodes so and this is does it mean it's 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 awful no it's not but what you want to do is you want always try to keep the workload inside the numa domain right so right? It, it it just takes up uh, a couple of more considerations before choosing this architecture over another or uh, how to design your VMs to run on that? Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you have a lot, if you have a lot of VMs that are small, um, like containers, uh, for instance, container-based VMs. The, yeah, that that's one of them. What you can think about um, is think about Kubernetes and think about worker nodes. Right, a worker node is uh, that runs Docker, which runs the containers, and the worker node itself typically runs Linux. Right, but Linux the, they have a NUMA optimization, a scheduler. But it's not really at the level that everybody wants uh, wants it to be. Right. Right. So what, typically, what we uh, recommend is, if you if you configure your, your your Kubernetes cluster, try to keep a Kubernetes worker node uh, inside a uh, Numa node. Right. A worker node in a Numa node. That's basically the idea. Now. If you have large uh, clusters with uh, with a lot of workload, and typically a container is small, uh, has a small footprint, but maybe you're doing right. Some, so it's some it's basically better to have more workers, more small workers than a couple of large workers. Exactly. Right. So in this scenario, what you will do is your your worker node will uh, will try to fit in the eight cores and in this memory footprint. Right. Now, one of the th uh, one of the things what you, what you need to take into account is the um, the memory uh, write speed because you have two memory cha uh, uh, channels per numa node means that you want to use both right so but you also need uh, a lot of capacity per yeah. numa node so yeah. if you use 16 uh, gig dims you want to have uh, uh, you basically get 32 gigs per NUMA node. Yeah. So think about that. Can my uh, can my VM, can my worker node, or whatever fit inside that 32 gig? Because otherwise, it needs to go to another one. And they have interconnects as well. Yeah. Right. But um, you have to hop sometimes, multiple times, because what we're doing here, and this is this is the the the, the interesting part. We're just talking here about one physical uh, uh, CPU packets, it, but it, we have two. It could it could even be that if you have two physical CPU packages, um, that your workload is spread across multiple NUMA nodes. Exactly. So what you right. will have here is I will draw it out in my worst way possible, apparently. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> and that comes from a guy who has a whiteboard in his... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Is I know because I, I bought his old one. Is that this uh, workload can uh, get memory from this one. Right. Now, we have interconnects internally, but there is also an interconnect between those two CPUs. Right. right? In that scenario, not every... Zeppelin die is connected to the other Zeppelin die. Internally, it is, right? Externally, you can have a multi hop uh, scenario where you basically go from this to this, and that one is connected to that. Right. That's where you see the in extremely uh, uh, inconsistencies. Now, one of the things to solve this is to, to gather a table to figure out the distance between the dif uh, different NUMA domains. And we, we do this for initial placement, but we don't do this for load balancing in vSphere. No, all right, okay. So we try to keep the, uh, the, 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 the VMs as close as possible, right. and we try to keep the memory access uh, as local as possible, but when we load balance, when we try to figure out within a system what is the best distribution, we do not uh, take distance into account, and with a, a, a AMD Epic system, this can lead to extreme inconsistencies. Right. So that's another reason to really understand. Look, I have small footprint workloads. Hey, AMD is perfect. 
if you're going to deploy VMs, large monoliths, large databases spanning multiple wide VMs, or what you said, monster VM, I don't would rec I don't want to recommend this one. Right. So both have their their absolute their place in in, uh, in 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 what we are seeing in trends, like like uh, big Kubernetes platforms. Um, uh, they would highly benefit from uh, an architecture like this. Um, but you also mentioned the ZND that yeah. that is uh, used by by companies like Facebook and Google yeah. and uh, um, that also have their place in in in, in how we run fertilization and NUMA uh, specifically. Exactly, and if you have uh, smaller, if you have more memory ban uh, demand than, than, than compute, uh, you might want to consider a CND. Well, you also have to think about licensing costs, of course, because yeah. you need to run vSphere on, on, on top of that. So coming from, from um, if you are an enterprise or an SMB, it might not be cost efficient to, to run Intel CND. But they are extremely capable for home labs, of course, and... Uh, Check my home lab on this URL because I, I absolutely love the ZND in combination with vSAN, GPUs, the whole shebang. So, ZND, awesome. Yeah, so for each technical challenge, there is a solution. But you have to think about it, and once you know the, the, the background, and once you know the underlying architecture, you can, fi you can find your solution. Right, cool. Um, so I have heard uh, in a recent episode of the Virtually Speaking podcast that you have submitted a paper for VMworld yeah. in which you would like to do a full hour on NUMA deep dive. Yeah, so what we discussed here, I'm going to uh, dive a little bit deeper and, and, and talk a little bit more about the different architectures uh, in what I like to call the session 60 minutes of NUMA. Wow. I hope it's accepted. It's going to be accepted, and uh, I have my ideas. Who should we bribe to 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 get oh, it I to be uh, <laughs> Adam Ackley. Uh, <laughs> um, so he, um, what I, what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, physical uh, architecture, virtual architectures, and CPU and sorry uh, VM configurations. I have the topics in my mind, but uh, I'm sure I'm missing something, right? So. What I want to ask you is, if you have an idea, if you have a pressing question about NUMA, please reach out to me uh, on Twitter, at Frank Deneman. You can check his email or his, uh, his information here. Yeah. And just, just, uh, just tweet me your question and ideas, what I, what I hope, what I can incorporate if my session is selected, of course. Awesome. So if people want to know more about NUMA right now, um, I guess they could check your blog and, and absolutely follow you on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, or buy the books. Or buy the books. Uh, host Resource Deep Dive is the one about NUMA. Uh, also wrote a book together with Duncan and Niels on clustering deep dive. I think that's a nice combination. And if you want to complete the whole stack, get the vSend book uh, as well. So you have almost like the, a resource kit, like what we used right. to have yeah, with, yeah, yeah. Uh, with um, Windows NT, the, and, and, uh, Windows NT resource kit. We're trying to do the same thing, but then on, on visual level. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Uh, and Thank you all for watching. If you have any questions about NUMA, you know how to reach Frank. Um, and for now, thanks for watching and see you next time.